Good morning and welcome back to Black Bear Forge. Today I thought I would take a look at making an iron rose. Now there are lots of different ways that blacksmiths make roses. Traditionally, roses were made out of large materials, something like inch to inch and a half round bar or square bar. The stems were drawn out and the petals of the rose were chiseled out of a big mass of the bar and those were drawn out. And a rose like that is a lot of work but they are also really a spectacular piece and a real test of your skills as a blacksmith. Today, however, I'm going to go with more of a contemporary approach to the rose, one that a lot of different blacksmiths use, and that is building the rose up out of sheet metal. And these are pre-cut sheet metal pieces for the petals. When I first started making these, I had a pattern that I would trace on sheet metal and I would cut with a pair of tin snips and that would take quite some time and they'd need to be cleaned up with a file and it just wasn't cost effective to put an hour into cutting out the raw materials for the piece. I, I couldn't justify charging the customer for that time and still sell any of these things. If I wanted to sell them I had to do something a little bit more efficient so I sent that pattern off to a laser cutter and I have these blanks cut by a laser cutter generally two dozen of each size at a time so that I've got a bunch of them on hand and I only have to do that about once every year or two years. Matter of fact it's been quite a while since I've done that because I just don't do very many of these anymore. But you don't have to have your own pattern. There are quite a few people out there online that sell these already cut out or ready to go. You just have to order them. And I will link to some of those folks down there in the video description. So if you want to buy some pre-cut sheet metal blanks, you can just buy enough for one rose, two roses, whatever it is you want to make. And there are several people that do that. And if I don't include your favorite supplier for these pre-cut blanks, feel free to put a link down there in the comments section. Hopefully we can cover all the suppliers for blanks like this that, that make these. For a full-size rose, I have five different sets of petals, plus a sepal and leaves, and then the stem is forged out of bar stock. The center section is about three inches, or about 80 millimeters round, and this biggest petal is about seven and a half inches, or roughly 120 millimeters round. And the four larger ones have five petals each. The smaller center one only has four petals. But for today's project, I'm only going to use the three smaller ones. The procedure is the same no matter how many of these you use. To do this, I just use a fairly sharp cross peen hammer, not one too heavy, and just put cross peen marks radiating out from the center all the way around the petal on one side. This helps spread this out a little bit, but it gives it a lot of nice texture. It makes a much nicer looking rose. A little light hammering really wears your forearm out, but it doesn't take too long to do one of these. So that's our three sets of petals. Now we need to give some shape to the petals. The texture should be on the outside. It'll look better that way. 
which means we need to dish them from the back side of the, the pedal. And to dish them, you've got some choices. I like to use a wooden stump, and I typically use a reposé style hammer with ball ends on it. But you can also work somewhat with a ball peen hammer, or you can just use ball tools if you have ball tools. We will also need a square punch, and I'll show you what we use that for in just a minute. Now you don't want to close these up all the way, you just want to get them starting in the right direction. And for that matter, we're going to run these through the fire. They're, they start getting really stiff and you can actually stress crack the sheet metal at this point. So I just try to get these to begin shaping like this. And I do that with all of the pedals. Then we'll go to the forge. We may change tools when we come back to this step. I've got a tighter depression here that I kind of worked the middle down into. So that's really about all there is for now. I set the pedals in a coal shovel and I just put them in there and let them warm up. Once they get up to an orange heat, I just set them aside and let them air cool. And air cooling really seems to de-stress these and soften them up enough. If you really need them a lot softer, you can certainly bury them in vermiculite and cool them a little bit more slowly. So the next thing we're going to do is make the stem, which is entirely drawn out of 3 8 round bar. Now the reason the stem is drawn out of round bar is because I like to have part still 3 8 round that represents the base of the flower. I'm sure there's a technical name for that. And that then has a tenon off the end that then gets riveted into the pedals and that provides a nice shoulder to put everything into. Makes it nice and tight, makes for a better assembly, makes for a little bit more realistic rows. I've seen a lot of people that just put a quarter inch bar in, put a little tack weld on the flower. Whatever you want to do works. I just think this looks a little bit better. I want to draw this out to about 3 16 diameter. And I only want to take about four inches or so down to start with because it will stretch quite a bit. So draw it out square. And if it's not quite long enough, we can take a little more material and draw that out to make it a little bit longer. It'll take several heats as it gets thinner, it cools off really quick. Ultimately, you just have to decide how long you want the stem on your rose. And if you draw out too much, it's easy to cut it to length. And yes, I typically do these under the power hammer. It is much faster that way. very close to what I want square wise. We'll clean it up at the face of the anvil then we'll go to octagon. Now remember in nature 
the stem is thinner up by the flower than it is at the end. So try not to make it real fat here and taper down to the place where it attaches to the main branch of the plant. Which means I need to work a little bit harder right here. Just come down with a hammer even at the edge of the anvil. Now this bulb area, whatever you call it, will taper into the stem a little bit. But once it gets to the stem, I want it either parallel or a little fatter down here, which generally doesn't happen. I'm lucky to get them parallel. So we'll go to octagon. So he really wants to twist it so light. Again, that's okay because it helps with the organic look. I'm going to go ahead and round this up, up at the top end so I'm just done with this. And that way we can just worry about this end. And we'll cut this off up here and then let it cool so I can turn it around and work on this section there. So we ended up with about 11 inches of stem overall. That's more than enough. I'll leave about an inch of 3 eighths round there. So there is our roughed out stem. You say we'll let it cool then we'll finish this end. So the next thing I want to work on are the leaves and these are just a cutout that is a starting point. This is not what the leaf looks like when it is done. I don't want any of this to look just like the cutout pattern when it's done. I want to completely reforge all of it. First thing I do with the leaves is I round up the stem so that it looks like a stem instead of a tab. So we'll do that to all three leaves. This ends up being more of a process of collapsing the stem and kind of rolling it than it does just upsetting it. Although now that I say that, I see this one's upsetting rather nicely. These get cold pretty fast, but as long as they stay soft, you can still do some of this. It is such a small piece. That's really all we need to do to that. Next thing we'll do is work on the leaf end. I gotta do that to all three of them. This was collapsing and rolling more than the first one did. That's okay. That lengthwise cold shut isn't going to make it weaker like a crosswise cold shut would.
So this is leaf number three. If you look at a rose, they typically have leaves and groups of three right under the flower, but leaves and groups of five if you go further down on the plant. So if you're doing a whole rose bush, you need to think about things like that. Most I've ever put together were three flowers on one main stem. So it had three groups of three under each flower and one group of five further down. But you can end up making a lot of leaves if you're doing something like that. Next thing I want to do is start thinning the leaf out a little bit. Just, just a little bit of foraging there, not much. These cool off quick, but they also heat up in the forge really quick as well. I've sharpened up my finest little hot chisel. These cool down to the point they're not really very hot by the time you get to cutting the little serifs in the edge of the leaf. This really makes for a better looking leaf though if you do this. And it's so thin it cuts easily cold. I go ahead and heat it between heats just to keep it kind of normalized and a little bit softer, easier to work with. Less risk of breaking something like the stem off. Be careful back here, if you slip, you accidentally cut that stem off. Yes, I've done that. Now those little serifs look a little chunky at this point, so I come back and I just kind of thin out the edge of the leaf. This helps spread it a little bit more and tends to make those look better. We'll do that to all three of the leaves. The next thing we'll do is put some veins in the leaves. This is just a suggestion of veins. Real leaves have quite a few and I'm using the same chisel. Again, careful not to cut all the way through. It's real easy to split the very end of these. Somebody recently asked, well how do you hold the material and you've got the chisel in one hand and the hammer in the other. And the answer is you just chase it around the anvil. 
and adapt to whatever you need to adapt to. But that gives the impression of veins in the leaf. As I do this, I look at the stem and see if one side of the stem joins the leaf neater and cleaner. After rolling it up, sometimes you end up with a funny spot. So instead of just going at random, I try to put those the funny spots to the back. Whatever looks the best, I try to put to the front. If you want more control, you could put this under a hold fast, but it isn't that big a deal to just follow the leaf around to the anvil as it moves. And these are just heating up in the gas forge that's off. Typically, I let them get a little hotter, but they are so thin that you can do a lot of work with them at this heat. That should be that for the chisel. These are still really boring looking leaves as far as I'm concerned. So using a V-block in the hardy hole and a very small cross-peen hammer, we can put a little bit of texture in these leaves, kind of roll them back there. Try and do all of them just a little bit different. But that really makes for a much more organic looking leaf. I like that a lot better. This is just art at this point, whatever you think this looks like, whatever you want it to look like. The truth is that real leaves aren't this three-dimensional. A lot of times they're fairly flat, but they look boring in ironwork if they're that flat. So I go ahead and do this to them. Now the last thing I need to do is two of these leaves have to have short stems on them. So I pick two that I decide I'm going to cut off. Then we have to do something to the third one as well. So I'm going to cut this off. So there's about an inch of stem left, about like that. Turn it upside down and just put a little offset over the edge of the anvil like that. I do that with two of the leaves, try to get them exactly the same length. Those two leaves will be joined that way in the end. And then the final leaf gets spread out at the very end. So it's just a little bit wider. And then if you can get it to curl in just a little bit. Kind of like a piece of celery. I've heard this actually referred to as a celery weld when you join all these together. I don't know if these will go exactly in this orientation, but ultimately they get welded with a torch, something like that. So we'll set the leaves aside and let them cool. And our stem is cool enough to hold. First thing we want to do is put a eighth inch square tenon on the end of this. So we'll start by butchering in. I'm just going to butcher in. Don't go all the way to your eighth inch mark though, or eighth inch size. Don't actually have a mark. 
If you go too far, you'll create a little nick in, the, in it, and then there'll be a good chance you'll ruin it. I'm going to go with a set of tenoning dies that will give me my eighth inch size here, or thereabouts. If it's a little bit oversized, that's okay too. And that just goes in between the tenoning dies. 90 degree turn each time. And we create our square tenon. There'll be a little bit of filing on this to make sure everything is good and flat and crisp. But to start with, forge it as close as you can. I think we can go one more heat. It's still a little bit fatter than I want. I don't mind it a little oversized, but not a lot oversized. Just make that a nice transition. That is our stem ready to go. That'll get more work as we assemble the rows, but for now I want to leave it pretty straight. Now remember, I said you were going to need a square punch, and that's because we just put a square tenon on our stem, and this way the pedals are stronger and they don't rotate. And just punching through into the end grain of the log works real well with a square punch like that, this thin material. So we're going to do that to all of them as we get to that point. For this piece, it has to cup around the stem. So I need to work this fairly tight. It gets hard to get a hammer in here, so I just use the ball punch. You can do all of this with ball punches of different sizes. And try to work around evenly so it doesn't just create one big dimple. A nice even transition there. The inner pedals, of course, need tighter bends than the outer pedals will, but you don't want to close these up all the way. You still need to be able to get in here to set the end of that uh, tenon as a rivet. And typically, the biggest one of these comes to the center, so you need to make sure these overlap the right direction. And this will all make sense as we actually start assembling the rows. as tight as you want to make these. You might have to come back later and enlarge this hole if you don't punch it big enough. You'll also need to take a pair of pliers and snap off the little tab on the back if you end up with one. Easy enough to do though. Now these should all overlap on one side and under on the other side. So it helps to kind of twist them a little bit to start. Kind of like making little impellers for your forge blower. Makes your life a lot easier in the final assembly if you get this going properly to start with. Of 
But in the long run, this piece goes inside that piece. Having different size impressions helps as you get bigger. If you're doing a rose with all five stacks of petals, and particularly you'll need different size hammers or ball punches and different depressions to work down in. After a while the small impression becomes the big impression and you make another small impression elsewhere. And I always try to do all my square punching because it in, in one place because it ends up embedding little bits of metal in there. So if you leave that in one place you can avoid it for everything else. Or you can have a special scrap of wood just for doing that. But I find a stump like this used for all the things I use it for lasts me about 20 years. No big deal. So, those will all go in there. So that's all of the component parts for a rose. We have a stem, we have three leaves, we have the sepal, and a set of three petals for a medium-sized rose. And these are fairly lifelike size roses. From this point on, it's pretty much all torch work and maybe a little bit of filing, but we probably won't use the forge for any of this at this point. So, an oxy... Oxyacetylene torch comes in really handy for doing these little tiny welds we're going to do. But if you've got a TIG welder, you could probably do them with that if you're good with it. I'm not that good with a TIG welder, so I prefer to weld with the torch. But it's a little afternoon, so I'm going to take a lunch break. If you, want to go, if you guys want to pause the video and go have a lunch break, I'll meet you right back here after lunch. Actually, let's go ahead and split this video into two parts. We will pick up the assembly in part two. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Make time in your day to get out to your shop, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. See you later.